The separation of church and state. It's an idea as American as let's do it anyway, or all food should have cheese on it. And yet secularism has been on the decline as a fundamental value of the U.S. government, particularly since the 1950s when under God was added to the pledge, and in God we trust replaced e pluribus unum. In my last video I went through some of the history of secularism. I talked about how secularism emerged as a fundamental American value in the first place, partially from Christian precepts. But ironically, today America is in practice one of the least secular states in the West, and the main proponents of the erosion of secularism are Christians. I want to argue here that secularism is a universal good. It's good for the members of minority religions, it's good for non-believers, and it's good for the members of the majority religion too. So join me as I answer this question about the separation of church and state. Why should I like that? First, let's start with those who benefit most obviously from the separation of church and state. Atheists, agnostics, non-believers of all stripes. I'm one of these people, and it seems natural that someone who lives without religion would not want to live under a religious authority. I don't believe that any rules derived through religious dogma rather than rational argument and scientific investigation are worthy of respect. I find it annoying when political figures talk about God, because I don't want them to do a job that has anything to do with God. God doesn't say anything about what the tax rate should be or whether affirmative action should be implemented to create a more egalitarian society. In fact, when religion does involve itself in government, it tends to intervene constantly against my values of individual choice, meritocracy, and social progress. Apparently, God doesn't want women to have the right to choose what happens to their own bodies, despite the fact that the only time abortion is mentioned in the Bible, it advocates drinking a potion that might cause a miscarriage if you suspect that your wife is cheating on you. I'm told that God doesn't want gays to have the same right to marry as straight people, and he doesn't want me to believe that climate change exists or that evolution is a fact. Never mind the fact that the Bible says nothing about climate change and barely contradicts evolution at all unless you read Genesis utterly literally. And that very same book of the Bible that tells me not to lie with a man as I would with a woman also tells me not to eat shellfish. I'm still waiting for that ban on pork and shrimp, by the way. But secularism doesn't necessarily mean that religious people can't have religious opinions, which they advocate in government. It just means that the government can't act based on religious criteria or discriminate based on religion. So while secularism can't protect me from religious people advocating a law against my eating of delicious, crispy bacon, it can protect my right to freely worship bacon and only bacon. It should also protect me from being forced to pray in a public school or be told that bacon worshippers are not real Americans. In truth, some have eroded secularism apparently in my favor. The Soviet Union attempted to crack down on religiosity, and as a result, you'll find most Russians today celebrate New Year's as an important family holiday rather than Christmas. That was an overreach, and it actually wasn't good for atheists. As an atheist, I don't want you to be forced to think like me or believe what I believe. I arrived at my perspectives about religion through the free exercise of my own intellectual capacity and careful study of the arguments in favor and against the existence of God. I was allowed to think about it and decide on my own. That's more important to me than agreement from other people. If everyone else on earth believed in God but me, I'd feel a little isolated perhaps, but that's a better feeling than knowing that others have been robbed of their freedom to decide on their own. I grew up in a Jewish household, so I'm also acutely aware of the concerns of religious minorities. I wish I could properly convey to you the sense of dread, revulsion, and fear I felt the first time I saw a swastika painted on a sidewalk. Religious minorities are often the targets of hate crimes. There have even been cases where Sikhs or Hindus have been assaulted by people who thought they were attacking Muslims. When the government creates a tone in which some are considered full valid citizens and others are not, it promotes a culture of discrimination and hatred. The only way to have a government that is truly inclusive for all people is to insist that the government authority intervenes in the world of religion only to protect the equal ability of all citizens to freely worship whatever and however they choose, except of course in cases where said worship interferes with other more fundamental rights. More practically, let's acknowledge the reality of religion in the United States today. According to Pew's religious landscape study, 70% of Americans are Christian, but that subdivides quite a bit. The most popular Christian sects are Evangelical Protestantism with roughly 25% of Americans and Catholicism with roughly 21%. 
That means no matter what your religion, in America you are a member of a religious minority. If the United States were to rule based on a church and officially establish a religion, at the very least 75% of the country would be alienated. And of course evangelical Protestants subdivide too, their largest component being Baptists at 9.3% of Americans, which subdivides again, with the largest subsect being Southern Baptists, representing just 5.3% of Americans. But let's just say for the sake of argument that Christianity was a monolith, that 70% of the country believes roughly the same thing and so we could reasonably establish Christianity as the state religion. Why would that be so bad for Christians? Well, truth be told, secularism isn't just about protecting religious minorities, the 23% who are unaffiliated or the 15% of Americans who call themselves nothing in particular. Secularism protects the state from the corrupting influence of religion. It also protects religion from the corrupting influence of politics and state authority. The truth is that secular power routinely and predictably corrupts religious institutions. Today the Pope has no authority and he tells us nice things like you can take your pet to heaven with you. In the Middle Ages, they had different things to say. Like let's go invade the Holy Land and kill all the infidels. If you're a Christian and think your pastor would do a much better job running the country than the snakes in Washington, you're probably right. But that's only true because your pastor doesn't have any power. If religious authorities had actual authority, that nice wise person who wants to help out the community would quickly lose his or her post to a spineless power hungry ogre. Positions of power attract the worst people. Perhaps Lord Acton put it best when he remarked that phrase most often misattributed to George Orwell. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you love your church now, imagine just how much you'd love it if it were run by this guy, or this lady, or this guy. Then ask yourself, why should I like that?